Welcome to Civil Services Achievers Point. Today we are discussing the Assam Tribune of 12th August. These are the various courses at Civil Services Achievers Point. Students, uh, please enroll in these courses to ensure a rank in the upcoming examinations. This discussion is primarily based on the APSC new pattern. However, it will also be useful for other state level examinations. So students, let us begin. This will be the important newspaper articles which we are going to discuss today and the important editorials. So students, we are beginning now. The first topic we are discussing today is very important from our general studies on Assam paper, political and administrative system of Assam. The newspaper article is Asu releases report on clause six of Assam Accord. So this is a very important topic and uh, much news and articles will be published on this issue. So subsequently we will be covering them as and when they appear in the newspaper and students are uh, advised to make a note of the important points so that they can be reproduced in mains and as well as in interview. So the uh, report on clause six of Assam Accord, uh, it basically gives us the definition of the Assamese, the term Assamese is, is mentioned in the Assam Accord. So the, so the clause six of the Assam Accord uh, talks about giving uh, cultural, legislative and administrative safeguard to the Assamese people. So that required to define what is meant by the term Assamese. So this report uh, tries to define or rather suggests the definition of Assamese. It further uh, suggestions is given reservation of seats in parliament, assembly, local bodies, introduction of inner line permit that is ILP, reservation of jobs and sealing of border. So these are the basic highlights of the report. So let us uh, try to understand what is in the report. The committee formed by the government of India for suggesting measures for implementation of clause six of the Assam Accord has recommended reservation of seats in assembly, parliament and local bodies for indigenous people of the state. So the committee which was formed by the government in India for suggesting measures for the implementation of clause six. So the clause six was inserted in the Assam Accord because the at that time of signing the Assam Accord, it was felt that uh, due to influx of uh, migrants, the local Assamese people may have uh, less number of uh, population because in a democracy, the, the population vote only counts. So if due to external migration, uh, the number of local people is less, then there is a threat of uh, the local people not being enough represented. So the first uh, suggestion made by the committee is recommendation of reservation of seats in the assembly, parliament, and local bodies for indigenous people of the state. However, there was difference of opinion among the members of the committee on the quantum of seats to be kept reserved. So uh, it was agreed by the members that there should be a reservation, but what should be the percentage that was debated. The report on clause six was uh, released by ASU. The committee headed by Justice Retired Biplab Sharma also gave a wide ranging recommendations, including protection of land rights, introduction of the inner line permit system, creation of upper house, measures for protection of languages and culture, etc. Now, here it includes the important measures such as protection of land rights so that land cannot be transferred to outside immigrants, land should be with the indigenous people. And this is in line with UN uh, recommendations on indigenous people's rights. Introduction of inner land permit system. This is one of the re recommendations so that whenever any uh, person outside from Assam, if he or she has to come to Assam, they have to apply for ILP. That is inner land permit system. Creation of upper house. Now this is a uh, this is an important recommendation. See, there is a provision in constitution for creating an upper house at state level also, so that if uh, there are many tribes and indigenous communities in Assam, which have, which have very less numbers, 
so they may not be well represented in the assembly so from among these communities certain learned persons certain significantly uh, important personalities may be recommended in the upper house so that that community gets a representation in the process in the assembly measures for protection of languages and culture also the uh, report recommends uh, protection of languages and culture there was a difference of opinion among members on the quantum of the seats to be kept reserved so there was a difference among the committee members the committee recommended that 80% of seats in parliament assembly and local bodies including the existing reservations should be reserved for assamese people so the committee has made 80% of seats reserved but the three all assam students union members in the committee expressed the view that there should be 100% reservation of seats for assamese people so uh, the committee has said that 80% should be the uh, reservations however the all assam students union members express that the reservation should be 100% now interestingly both the views were incorporated in the report so that the government may take a final call on the reservation uh, percentage the committee gave its recommendations on the vexed issue of definition of assamese people for giving constitutional protection and said that the citizens of india who were now here the committee gave its recommendation on the definition of assamese people and it says citizens of india who were parts citizens of india who were parts of assamese community of assam on or before january 1st 1951 any indigenous tribal community of assam residing in the territory of assam on or before january 1st 1951 any other indigenous community of assam residing in the territory of assam on or before january 1st 1951 so january 1st 1951 has been taken as a cut off date all other indian citizens residing in the territory of assam on or before the same date that is january 1st 1951 and their descendants so these communities the indian citizens and their descendants should be treated as assamese people so this definition is important now the report has been uh, given uh, submitted to the government once government approves then the definition will be highly highly important but now for reference students should keep a note of the definition of assamese people as recommended by the committee the committee recommended creation of an upper house in the state and said that the seats of the same should be kept reserved for assamese people it also suggested introduction of inner line permit system in the state in the matter of employment the committee recommended that 80% of the jobs in group c and d level posts in central government semi central government central psus and private sector should be kept reserved for assamese people so here the committee further recommends that in the group c and group d level posts the reservation should be 80% for assamese people in central government semi central central psu and private sector however on this issue also the asu members demanded 100% reservation the committee expressed is the committee expressed uh, expressed its dismay over the uh, failure of the government in implementing the key points of the assam accord even after 35 years of signing of the accord and said that implementation of the accord is essential for providing constitutional protection to the assamese people so the committee at the same time expressed its disappointment in the delaying of the implementation of the assam accord after 35 years of signing it and it further said that the implementation of the accord is essential for providing constitutional protection to assamese people we are at a loss to understand why after 73 years of independence the eastern border that is the border with bangladesh is left for us we have been reliably informed that the entire western border with pakistan is not only properly fenced but properly manned the committee expressed its disappointment that the border with our western border is uh, very not only properly fenced but also properly manned that is well protected and well armed
However, the eastern border with, with uh, Bangladesh is still left for us at many, at many parts. The committee said that the uh, central government should take up the issue of deportation of the foreigners who came to Assam after the midnight of March 24, 1971 with the government of Bangladesh. Now, these dates are very important. See, as per the Assam Accord, the midnight after the midnight of March 24, 1971, every foreigner should be deported. And as you will be uh, already aware that, that this, is, this was the cutoff date for our NRC preparation. Okay, so March 24, 1971 only says that after this date, whoever comes is a foreigner and is not an Indian citizen. However, this date is not taken for the Assamese definition of Assamese people. For the definition of Assamese people, it is taken 1st January 1951. Okay, so these dates are very important. Students, please do not get confused. You read them multiple times, revise them multiple times. Slowly, you will understand and it will get imbibed in your memory. The uh, committee further says, till such deportation is completed as an interim measure, the post-1971 migrants should be resettled outside Assam. So it further recommends that. The committee further said that prompt and adequate measures should be adopted to completely seal the international border with Bangladesh within a specific time frame. So within a specific time frame, the committee recommends that the border should be sealed. The committee further said that the Assam Official Language Act 1960 should be implemented strictly and necessary amendments should be made to insert penal provisions for violation of the act. An autonomous language and literary academy or council should be created and it, should, and it should be given statutory status to protect, preserve, promote all indigenous languages of Assam. So, further the committee recommends on the preservation and uh, protection of the Assamese and the other indigenous, indigenous languages of Assam. So, the committee in this regard recommends that the Assam official language act 1960 should be implemented strictly and there should be penal provisions that is there should be punishments uh, for violation of the act and autonomous language and a literature academy or council should be created so the committee recommends the uh, creation of an autonomous language and literary academy or council so that uh, and it also recommends that it is given statutory status to protect preserve and promote all indigenous languages of Assam. It should be headed by a distinguished literary person, the committee said. The committee further said that in all English medium schools, both under the state and central boards, Assamese subjects should be made compulsory up to class 8 or even class 10 level if possible. So this is, I think, a very welcome step because if anyone is residing in Assam, and if uh, that student, even if that student studies in English medium school, that student should have Assamese language, language at least class 8. So that is a very welcome step so that people residing in Assam should be knowing the Assamese language, Assamese culture, and also at the same time uh, promote our culture and our literature. Now coming to the next topic. Vaisnavite scholar Narayan Goswami passes away. Now, this is an important topic under the general studies of Assam, culture and heritage of Assam. Venerable Satradikar of Mazuli, Notun Kamalabari Hotro, and a leading Vaisnavite scholar of the country, Narayan Chandra Goswami is no more. He breaded his last at Guwahati on Tuesday. Uh, the 76-year-old Goswami was suffering from chronic liver disease and had been under treatment since July 9. Now, Satradikar Goswami, who is known for his scholarly works on Brajavali language and neo vaisnavite religion, that is the religion propagated by our uh, Simanta Sankadev, uh, the neo vaisnavite religion that is called the Ek Saran, That is called the Eksharan Nam. Satradikar Goswami, who is known for his scholarly works on Brajavari language and neo vaisnavite religion and Satriya culture, was an authority on 
satriya dance as we know the satriya dance is a one of the six uh, classical dances of india he was honored with the srimanta sankadev award by the government of assam in 2004 and has a number of books to his credit including satriya sanskriti swarnarekha brajavali bhashar byakaran aru abhidhan satriya nitar byakaran aru ahomot bhavanar parampara which are recognized as reference books by both dibrugar university and guwahati university so uh, the books written by him are used by the uh, dibrugar university and guwahati university as reference books also a sanskrit scholar the satrikar has translated into assamese the original sanskrit ramayana authored by valmiki he has edited kirtan ghosha and nam ghosha ankya plays borgits of simanta sankardeva and his apostle madhavdeva and sankardev's literary works among others besides he has penned nine plays and over 60 articles on various issues concerning neo vaishnava religion and culture of assam he also contributed to ahomya biswakuk published by the assam sahitya sabha he was conferred the honorary honorary d lit degree by dibrugo university in 2010 for his works on satriya culture he was a member of the first General body of Simanta Sankardev Kalasatra Samaj. The model remains of Goswami were taken to Simanta Sankardev Kalasatri and subsequently to Mazuli, uh, where his last rites were performed with state honors. So this topic is important from our mains perspective also, and also in prelims perspective, uh, APSC may ask a question from it. Please, students, make a note of it and revise them regularly because uh, in our syllabus topic in the culture. there is a, a sub topic naming important personalities in the history art culture literature tradition and heritage there is a um, syllabus topic religious movements leading personalities so apsc may uh, pick a question from the current happenings now coming to the next topic supreme court notice to center on ilp that is the inner line permit this topic is very important and it will be studied under general studies two paper polity and constitution admitting a plea filed, uh, filed for introduction of the inner line permit in assam the supreme court on tuesday issued notices to center ret returnable within two weeks so the supreme court issued notice to center and asked the center to answer or reply within two weeks challenging the center's notification of december 11 last the assam jatiyata party juba chhatra parishad and all tai ahom students union so the two students body filed a petition in the supreme court before a bench headed by the chief justice of india s a bodbe describing the issue as serious the supreme court in a virtual hearing issued notice to the center to respond within two weeks the council for ajycp vikas singh sought an interim stay on the central government's notification the atasus council runa bhuya pointed out to the bench that the center had not responded to its earlier direction earlier on june 4 the supreme court had issued notice to the center returnable within 2 weeks on the pleas challenging the presidential order amending the bengal eastern frontier regulations 1873 BEFR to deny Assam an inner line permit system to insulate it from the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. So uh, students might be aware of this that when the Citizenship Amendment Act was proposed, the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulations 1873 was uh, amended or modified so as to uh, keep Assam out of the ILP purview. and uh, it further the modified version further helped in adding manipur into ilp system so uh, further the news says a bench of chief justice of india s a bobde and justices as as bapanna and hrishikesh roy while conducting the hearing through video conference however refused to gra grant ex parte stay on the operation of the presidential order so the supreme court bench however refused to stay the operation of the presidential order so this 
uh, news is important and as and when this news will progress we will discuss it and students kindly please uh, make a note of what is ilp and in which states currently ilp is uh, implemented in our daily current affairs based mcqs we have already covered this topic on ilp students are encouraged to kindly keep a track of it and revise the mcqs also now coming to the next topic russia develops world's first covid-19 vaccine this topic will be studied under general studies 3 technology topic president vladimir putin on tuesday announced that russia has developed the world's first vaccine against covid-19 that works quite effectively and forms a stable immunity against the disease as he disclosed that one of his daughters has already been vaccinated a vaccine against coronavirus has been registered for the first time in the world this morning putin said I know that it works quite effectively. It forms a stable immunity. Further, quoted Putin. Putin's claim has come amidst concerns raised by experts about the speed of Russia's work, suggesting that researchers might be cutting corners. So, the speed at which the vaccine was developed, it raises question on the on whether it followed the protocols, international protocols, and the various processes. Amid fears that safety could have been compromised. The World Health Organization urged Russia last week to follow international guidelines for producing a vaccine against COVID-19. The Russian vaccine is not among the WHO's list of six vaccines that have re reached phase three clinical trials, which involve more widespread testing in humans. Putin said that one of his daughters had tested a Russian COVID-19 vaccine on herself and that she is feeling well. So Putin is very much uh, asserting that the vaccine is very good and it is it forms stable cell and antibody immunity. I know this very well because one of his daughters got vaccinated. So Putin is uh, asserting that the va vaccine is very good and it is working very well in the body. The vaccine has been named Sputnik V. The name is a reference to the surprise 1957 launch of the world's first satellite by the Soviet Union. So this vaccine is not only a, uh, not only a, uh, is not only aimed at curing or minimizing the spread of COVID-19, but at the same time using the opportunity to regain what was once the fame and glory or the position of the Soviet Union in the world. So that's why to give the feeling of the uh, Cold War period. And at the height of Soviet Union, the vaccine is named as Sputnik V. So here, this simple development of the vaccine is linked with geopolitics and our evolving international relations. So now coming to the next important topic, very important topic. Supreme Court has said that daughters have equal co personary rights, that is joint ownership or joint heirship rights in joint Hindu family. This topic we will study under General Studies 2 paper, Polity and Governance. Holding that daughters cannot be deprived of the right of equality, the Supreme Court Tuesday ruled that they will have equal heirship or equal co personary rights in joint Hindu family property, even if the father died before the Hindu Succession Amendment Act 2005. A bench of justices Arun Mishra, S. Nazir, and Amar Shah said the provisions contained in substituted section 6 of the Hindu Succession Act 1956 confer the status of co personer on the daughter born before or after amendment in the same manner as a son with the same rights and liabilities. So the judgment said, a, 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 the bench of uh, the Supreme Court bench said that the provisions contained in the substituted section 6 of the Hindu Succession Act 1956 conferred the status of co personal on the daughter same in, in the same manner as a son with the same rights and same liabilities. So the verdict or the, uh, the rule by the, the ruling by the bench says that the daughters have the same right to ownership and right to heirship 
as the son in the same manner as the son with the same rights and also with the same liabilities also the verdict makes it clear the amendment to the hindu succession act 1956 granting equal rights to daughters to inherit ancestral property would have retrospective effect so the amendment to the hindu successive uh, hindu succession act 1956 it was amended in 2005 granted equal rights to daughters to inherit ancestral property and that to have retrospective effect that is the uh, the decision or the judgment of the act of the amendment of the act in 2005 will also be applicable to earlier based pending decisions prior to 2005 that is the meaning of retrospective effect retrospective effect means suppose the law was passed in 2019 then normally from 19 onwards the judgment would be valid however if in the judgment is passed with retrospective effect then the cases of 2017 2018 will also come under the purview of the judgment of 2019 the top court which overruled its earlier 2015 decision in which it had held that the rights under the amendment are applicable to living daughters of living co-personers as on september 9 2005 irrespective of when such daughters are born also observed that a daughter always remains a living daughter so uh, the top court which overruled its earlier 2015 decision in which it had held that the rights under the amendment are applicable to living daughters of living co-personers on september 9 2005 irrespective of when daughters are born and it also observed that a daughter remains a living daughter always uh, remains a living daughter it also quoted its earlier judgment and said a son is a son until he gets a wife however a daughter is a daughter throughout her life so such was the uh, judgment by the court the three judges bench tuesday said the rights can be claimed by the daughter born earlier with effect from september 9 2005 with savings as provided in section 6 1 as to the disposition or alienation partition or testamentary disposition which had taken place before december 2004 so as i already explained to you this retrospective effect the meaning of re retrospective effect means that the rights can be claimed by the daughter born earlier with effect from september 9 so prior to september 9 if there is any uh, cases it can be come under the under this judgment purview so further going to the uh, topic since the right in co-parenting co-parenting is by birth it is not necessary that father co-personer should be living as on september 925 co-personer is a term used for a person who assumes a legal right in parental property by birth only so co-personer is a term is this important and in prelims apsc may ask what do we mean by co-personer so co-personer is a term used for a person who assumes a legal right okay the right to property uh, legal right in parental property by birth only the apex court in its 121 page judgment said the statutory fiction of partition created by provision to section 6 of the hindu succession act 1956 as originally enacted did not bring about the actual partition or deception or of co-personary so this topic is important and students Uh, this topics this points may be quoted on any question on women's rights uh, based issues so we may quote these points and um, students are advised to make a note of it and keep on revising now the next uh, topic industrial production declines 16.6 percent is in zone this topic will be studied under general studies 3 economic development industrial production declined by 16.6% in june mainly due to lower output of manufacturing mining and power generation as per the government data according to the index of industrial production iip data manufacturing sector production registered a decline of 17.1% while the output of mining and power 
fell 19.8% and 10% respectively. In a press release, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, that is the ministry which publishes the IIP, students please make a note of it, which ministry publishes which report, because APSC may ask a question regarding this. We are also covering these important topics in our daily MCQs. Students, please read those MCQs and revise them. In a press release, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation issued a disclaimer saying that it may not be appropriate to compare the IIP in the post-pandemic uh, months with the IIP for months preceding the COVID-19 pandemic. So the uh, index of industrial production IIP data may uh, not be comparable to the earlier data because of the COVID-19 lockdown. However, on a monthly basis, the index of industrial production has shown improvement. The IIP had expanded by 1% year on year in June 2019. The data further revealed that the contraction in the consumer durables and capital goods segment was 35.5% and 36.9% respectively during June. However, consumer, consumer non-durable segment posted a growth of 14%. So students, let us understand what is the meaning of index of industrial production IIP. Definition, the index of industrial production IIP is an index which shows the growth rates in different industry groups of the economy in a stipulated period of time. The IIP index is computed and published by the central statistical organization on a monthly basis. Description, IIP is a composite indicator that measures the growth rate of industry groups classified under broad sectors like mining, manufacturing, and electricity, use-based sectors, namely goods-based, capital goods, basic goods, capital goods, and intermediate goods. IIP index is currently calculated using 2011 to 2012 as the base year. Students, if uh, you are finding it difficult to understand these terms and the meaning of the base year and all, yeah, please uh, enroll to our courses, on online courses. In our economics classes, we will very briefly and very comprehensively dis discuss the various uh, facets of the various uh, indicators published in Indian economy, like the GDP, IIP, CPI, repo rate, the monetary policy. So these are very important topics. APSC repeats these questions both in preliminary, uh, preliminary examinations and mains examination. So a thorough understanding of these topics and repeated revision will help us. IIP index components. Now this is a very important question. Both UPSC and APSC has asked on this. The eight core industries that constitute the IIP are electricity, crude oil, coal, cement, steel, refinery products, natural gas, and fertilizers are the eight core industries that comprise about 40% of the weight of items included in the index of industrial production, that is the IIP. Mining, manufacturing, and electricity are the three broad sectors in which IIP constituents fall. Now coming to the uh, important editorials, the first editorial which we are discussing today is Uh, is titled Worthy Initiative, and this topic will come under General Studies 3 Economic Development and Security. Union Defense Minister Rajnath Singh's recent announcement that the Defense Ministry will embargo 101 items to give a boost to indigenous defense production in a bid to strengthen the Atmanivar Bharat initiative taken by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has to be seen in the context of the current import and export scenario of the nation's arms requirements. In the five year span between 1915 and 1919, the world's top five arms importers had been Saudi Arabia, India, Egypt, Australia, and China, which together accounted for 36% of all global arms imports. Confronted as she had been with increasingly belligerent neighbors such as China, Pakistan, India, had been 
coerced into attempted modernization of our armed forces by acquiring combat jets, helicopters, submarines, warships, artillery guns, and assault rifles from countries like Russia, US, France, and Israel, which had made her the second biggest importer in the world. So it mentions in this paragraph that India is facing increasingly troubles from its neighbors, China on one hand and Pakistan on the other. India had uh, India has been forced to modernization of our armed forces by acquiring combat jets, which is a fighter jets, helicopters, submarines, warships, artillery guns, and assault rifles from countries like India imports come from countries like Russia, USA, France, and Israel. And this has made India the second biggest importer in the world. While Russia and the US continue to be India's biggest suppliers, the nation had also acquired military hardware from other countries, including Scanter 6000 radars from Denmark, Embraer ERJ-145 jets for a homegrown airborne early warning and control system from Brazil, ACTS sonar systems from Germany, super rapid 76mm naval guns from Italy, and K9 Thunder 155mm artillery guns from South Korea. So in contrast, in stark contrast, India ranked 23rd among the world's 25 largest arms exporters uh, and primary clients of India are Myanmar, Sri Lanka and Mauritius. Arms imports therefore eat up a sizable slice of India's defense budget even as it acts as a breeding ground for corruption witnessed by the numerous procurement scams of an earlier era. India's chief rival China, in spite of having a bigger army and defense setup, had been gradually producing more and more defense equipment within the country in itself, including sophisticated items such as aircraft carriers. So China has been producing more and more equipment, defense equipment within its country itself. It has become imperative that, that the indigenous arms industry play a more substantial role in meeting India's needs, which is why the announcement made by Singh has to be seen as a worthy initiative. The initiative envisages the award of contracts to indigenous manufacturers worth almost, almost uh, 4 lakh pro rupees during the next 6 to 7 years, which should enable them not merely to enhance production efforts, but also acquire the required technical know-how and sophistication. Such, initiative, such an initiative presents an opportunity for a nation's defense industry to manufacture the items in the embargoed list by using their own design or by adopting the technologies developed by Indian R&D and in the process augment their technological prowess. So such an initiative gives an opportunity for the nation's manufacturing industry to rise up to the occasion and also develop the research and development within the country. However, it is needless to add that the indigenous industry must have the prerequisite capability if our defense forces are not to be left in the lurch by shoddy production or inordinate delay, given that the list of embargoed items include artillery guns, LCH, sonar weapon systems, high-tech weapon systems, corvettes, transport aircraft, and armored fighting vehicles. So the article for, uh, further discusses that the indigenous industry must have the requisite capability and should not keep the defense forces in a uh, like at a disadvantaged position by uh, delaying the production or giving uh, not uh, up to the mark products because the list also contains very important items which are very crucial for any modern day combat. Now coming to the next topic, Elephant Day. Uh, Elephant Day has been observed and this topic will be studied under General Studies 3 biodiversity and environment. The plight of elephants in their few remaining habitats in Asia and Africa stares us in the face even as we celebrate another World Elephant Day. So many wildlife animals are restricted to certain areas like there are elephants found only in the continents of Africa and Asia. Lions are found only in Africa and Asia and in Asia only in India it is found and in India it is only found in the Gir uh, region. So 
every effort has to be taken to preserve not only preserve the wild animals but also the environment or the natural habitat in which the wildlife lives indeed this occasion should make us concerned about the future of the pachyderm and in put in place urgent remedial measures for preservation and protection of elephants and their habitats because protection of elephants is not only required but their habitat should also be preserved loss of habitat poaching and an escalating man animal, animal uh, man elephant conflict are the biggest factors that threaten long term survival of this magnificent animal and notwithstanding mounting global concerns in recent times the elephant is increasingly finding itself on slippery grounds because we know that due to fragmentation of forests and poaching and the deforestation the man elephant conflict is increasing is on the rise and assam which remains one of the last strongholds of the asian elephant has also witnessed drastic erosion of prime elephant habitats and elephant corridors so uh, the as i said that uh, in asia elephants are found uh, along with africa however assam is one of the last strongholds of the asian elephant and there has been a drastic decrease in the elephant habitats and elephant corridors due to various developmental activities this in turn has triggered an intense man elephant conflict that is extracting a heavy toll of elephant and human lives every year the state government keeps talking about both short term and long term measures being undertaken to mitigate the conflict but the ground reality is very disappointing because there is loss of habitats and corridors and massive there is uh, deforestation this is borne out by the unabated conflict situation and more worryingly the conflict seems to be spreading to new areas it is apparent that a conservation approach centering on only national parks and wildlife sanctuaries will not ease the problem as much of the elephant habitats falls outside this protected areas so this is a very very important point friends please make a note of it because in challenges faced by the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and various challenges in protection of wildlife in india this point may be mentioned that we should not only focus on the conservation of the national parks and the wildlife areas but also on the elephant habitats uh, which falls outside this protected areas so the, the trust therefore will have to be on preserving the reserve forests as well which constitute a major habitat for the long ranging elephants aside forming a major territory for the pachyderms the reserve forests also maintain contiguity for the protected areas so the protection of the reserve area, reserve forests is very important the growing predicament of the elephant in what is regarded as one of its last bastions should concern everyone including policy makers governments conservationists and the people as a general the deteriorating situation warrants besides short term uh, measures aimed at warding of marauding herds securing elephant habitat preventing its degradation and fragmentation and reclaiming <coughs> reclaiming lost habitat to the possible extent while this is easier said than done any compromise with forest protection will render the situation totally unmanageable in the coming days so the article further says that Uh, it should be ensured that uh, elephant habitat is secured degradation and fragmentation is prevented uh, prevented and lost habitat should be reclaimed these are the some of the possible steps while the state government is repeatedly claiming that the state has adequate green cover it is willfully remaining oblivious to the alarming loss of dense forests in the state so for elephant habitat we not only need forests but we need dense forests and the forests should not be fragmented fragmented forests are not so much helpful because if suppose there are two three large uh, forest areas but in between there are developmental activities human activities then the wild animals cannot move from the one uh, uh, reserve forest areas to the other so that creates a problem 
vast tracts of dense forest reserves have totally disappeared in the past couple of decades. Many of the traditional elephant corridors today cease to exist as our authorities have allowed human settlements and industries to replace these vital links. Recognition of the elephant as India's heritage animal will sound no more than empty rhetoric. So the article finally says that uh, sufficient steps as suggested in the article should be taken. Then only we will ensure the survival of elephant and also its habitat. Now the next topic, uh, next area is very important from our general studies on Assam paper, Environment and Disaster Management. The article is Proti Rudhi Bondhu as Community Leaders. So going to the uh, topic, community leaders play a major role in reducing the impact of natural and man-made disasters. With the progress of time, the use of advanced early warning systems and other technologically superior tools are becoming an integral part of the, of the disaster management system. The Assam State Disaster Management Authority, ASDMA, is equipped with the advanced flood early warning system and the lightning and storm early warning system with high accuracy and larger dissemination of information along with other support systems. So the Assam State uh, the Assam State Disaster Management Authority, ASDMA, is equipped with advanced flood warning system and the lightning and storm early warning system. So, not only floods, but also with lightning and storm and also with larger dissemination of information. That is the information to be provided to the general public. The disaster management systems can work efficiently and effectively only when man and machine work in unison. Technology can generate information while human intervention yields the desired results. So in order to better manage the disaster for better and effective disaster management, both uh, man and machine should work in cooperation or unison. Technology can generate information while man inter or while human intervention gives, gives us the desired results. So this is a very good line. In essays, students, you may use this line. This line is very important. See, this is the important, this is the importance why we should read the editorials very carefully. And students are advised, students are advised to uh, make a note of this editorial or keep a um, note of this editorial so that they can be revised. And in the actual mains examination, these small, small points can be added in our uh, introduction or conclusion of our essays and that will give us additional marks. So students, please make a note of it. Multi-hazards warning can, be, can only be successful if the warning it produces reaches the individual, uh, individuals at risk. That is those who are at the risk. If the information reaches them, then only the warning system is successful and it's easy to understand to result in appropriate responses. Despite all the resources, the rate of causality in respect of lightning, drowning, causing deaths of children, others, loss of property, etc., have not got reduced as expected. So despite we having all the resources, the rate of casualty in respect of lightning, drowning, okay, loss of property have not reduced. The State Disaster Risk Mitigation Fund, that is the SDRMF, Allocation for Relief and Rehabilitation, has a significant impact on the socio-economic sector of the state. The amount sanctioned under the SDRMF is more than the budget of many major developmental departments of the state. So there is a specific fund allocated for relief and rehabilitation. So students, please make a note of it. This point may be, may be used in examination. It has an all pervasive effect on sustainable economic growth having scope of convergence at the grassroots. Only people's participation and awareness can afford total utilization of funds. So along with technology and government's uh, various schemes and policies, at the grassroots level, people's participation and awareness is also very important. The SDRMF, is used for local level and community-based interventions 
which reduce the risk and promote and promote environment friendly settlement of livelihood at times due to the lack of information beneficiaries under animal husbandry and veterinary fishery agriculture horticulture sericulture handloom and textile pnrd etc departments remain deprived of the due financial assistance this is where the concept of individuals of different locales as protirudhi bandhu has been conceived as community leaders protirudhi bandhu can be the bridge between the beneficiaries and the department so under the various departments of the government like animal husbandry veterinary fishery agriculture horticulture sericulture and so and so forth the departments have many information but these information may not be uh, properly utilized and the departments remain deprived of the due financial assistance so due to bridge this um, bridge this link between beneficiaries and the department the protirudhi bandhu the idea of protirudhi bandhu has been conceived timely damage assessment proper information of the items covered under sdr mf it is the fund due procedure of submission for flood damage need to be known at all levels for effective and transparent execution community leaders have a major role in disseminating it is the passing on the information among the stakeholders and also in arrangement of gao sabhas social audit for successful community based interventions so this is a very important point that the community leaders have a major role in disseminating such information among the stakeholders and also in arrangement of gao sabhas social audit now this is a very new topic or very recent uh, topic social auditing social audit for successful community based intervention community leaders being the first line of responders act as a link to establish effective structure and communication protocol they act as a motivating force to encourage group effort tool of effective time management bridge between the administration and the citizen etc when the state of assam was in the grip of fear and anxieties and when people were trying to get rid of the rot of covid-19 finding solutions protirudhi bandhu has emerged as the savior at the community level they being the sentinel of humanity and epitome of hygiene at one call from the assam state disaster management authority 16000 people across the state had registered themselves as protirudhi bandhu dedicating their selfless services to the people of the assam at the time of pan pandemic when the situation worsened in several districts these volunteers of non medical front have come forward even for the cremation of the dead bodies of the covid 19 patients by donning or by wearing ppe kits besides performing other services as entrusted by the district administrations even many women as protirudhi bandhu have also joined the initiative and dedicated their services in the non medical arena including during the bagzan disaster in tinjukia so these are the recent incidents in assam where the protirudhi bandhu have landed their help the community volunteers are deployed at quarantine centers train stations transit checkpoints banks busy market places etc besides extending support towards the mental well being also of the vulnerable segments creating in the process a benchmark in the field of community service so the uh, protirudhi bandhu are not only engaged at various places but also it, it extends support towards the mental well being of the vulnerable segments there is the aged people the uh, multiple uh, diseased persons that is the comorbid persons are also given various support for mental well being in the beginning almost 500 protirudhi bandhus were deployed in guwahati city starting from contract tracing with police distribution of gratuity gratuity relief crowd management and social distancing at foro hojai quarantine center etc so the protirudhi bandhus have been initially given various tasks as mentioned here currently they are doing awareness drives in the landslide prone areas along with the asdma officials at times they have to face awkward situations while dealing with people residing in the hill areas under dangerous conditions some of them were also 
detected with COVID-19. So at the line of duty when they are working, they were also infected with the COVID-19 while extending volunteer services. It is the zeal of social service instilled in their minds that has helped these unsung heroes to transform things. Strengthening of community leaders is pertinent for onward strengthening of community risk resilience at all levels to address disaster risk reduction. With the intervention of field officials of the ASDMA, Pratyodhi Bandhu has earned distinction in the field of community leaders and is a force to reckon with now, with lots of expectations towards a disaster resilient Assam. So in order to make a disaster resilient Assam, as Assam is uh, prone to multiple disasters like uh, floods, erosion, landslide, so, uh, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. So Assam has been uh, dealing with multiple disasters. So this Pratyoti Bandhu has, is, can now act as a, a very strong community leaders and a force to reckon with lots of duties and responsibilities. The rise of Pratyoti Bandhu needs to be nurtured with much care, augmenting sustainable growth of the institution. As the concept of community leader has been recognized by institutions like NDMA and other organizations, the future perspective of Proteodi Bondhu provides multiple benefits and a win-win situation for all. From dissemination of information of early warning system, taking lead leadership in the formation of ward-wise task forces, village-level vulnerability mapping, key role in preparation of Gao Panchayat level disaster management plan, which is mandated by the relief manual and the primary activity of disaster management, participation in relief and rehabilitation process, etc. Pratyodhi Bandhu can be the best example of community leaders. A strong representation of disaster management authority at village and ward level needs to be functional and visible. Within the last decade, growing recognition of the necessity of community volunteers for sustainable disaster reduction was translated into actions to realize community-based disaster management. So the whole uh, idea of disaster management at village and ward level is now a reality and this opportunity bondo is making it happen. The sustainable uh, disaster management. So as it is mentioned, within the last decade, growing recognition of the necessity of community volunteers for sustainable disaster reduction was translated into actions to realize community-based disaster management. So the disaster management is now at the community level. It is high time to reorganize and empower Pratyodhi Bandhu in a sustainable manner with the shifting of paradigms with reactive emergency management to disaster risk reduction. So these are various uh, various dimensions of disaster management. Uh, in our main topic, we have the disaster management topic. In the topic, we will discuss this various subparts or dimensions of disaster management. So students, uh, this is the end of this aerial. At last, we are taking uh, Apne Desko Jano initiative, which is published in the Assam Tribune daily. So from here, we take out the important uh, Apne Desko Jano initiative. Now the World Youth Day, here we can see uh, Swami Vivekananda as he is meditating. Uh, though August 12th is designated as International Youth Day, several countries, including India, have different Youth Day. So APSC may ask, what is the International Youth Day or what is the National Youth Day? So those two days will be different. The International Youth Day is August 12th. However, in India, the National the National Youth Day is on January 12th to mark the birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. So this point may be uh, asked in prelims of APSC. Students, please make a note of it and try to remember it so that if any question comes in prelims, we will answer it correctly. So here are the uh, important courses and classes available at Civil Services HFS point. Students, Please enroll uh, in our classes. Now the online classes are going on. Very soon we will be bring, uh, 
we will be beginning the offline regular class also so students we are encouraging you to join and please uh, like the video and subscribe the uh, youtube channel so that if any new video comes then it will you will get a, a notification thank you